Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Warm welcome to join our second webinar under the Well You Project Framework. Let's wait for a couple minutes for more attendees to join, and then we will start. Just one more minute. Okay, let's give start to our webinar. Well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Nunez, the mental health advocacy advisor for the Well You Project at SOS Children's Villages International. Uh, I'm thrilled to serve as your moderator for today's events, and it's already a pleasure to see a robust turnout with over already 40, almost 50 participants already joining us. And the overwhelming response, we had over 270 registered attendees, and this really underscores the significance and relevance of today's uh, topic. Um, our objective today is to delve into the challenges and successes uh, encountered during the implementation of the WellU project in Italy, Greece, Hungary, and Romania. And our overarching goal for in our project in general is to actively contribute to shaping national and EU level policy recommendations by levering uh, insights delivered from um, our extensive efforts uh, within the project. This webinar will be guided by expert trainers and is designed to explore systemic barriers and share both implementation challenges and key insights uh, gained from the WellG project. And we are really excited to facilitate a dynamic discussion, not only to highlight the hotel space but also to uh, to show the positive strides made in the realm of mental health and psychosocial support in, during the ongoing um, Ukrainian displacement crisis. Um, uh, two online surveys uh, will be conducted. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Child Hub website. I will be sharing the link later on. Uh, your microphones and camera will be um, turned off during the webinar. And um, you please feel free to type your questions during the Q&A at any time. And later on the open floor discussion, we will be able to address um, these questions. Hey, Heidi, may I ask you to, before I introduce our speakers, uh, may I ask you kindly to share the participation brief poll? Just for a couple minutes your valuable input is appreciated.
Okay, perfect, Heidi. Perfect. Then let's move on. Our speakers for today uh, include Eleftheria Aravido, she's the head of psychosocial support programs for Teltesom Hellas, and Mitaru, the international director of advocacy at SOS Children's Villages International. George Canaris is the child protection project coordinator at Teltesoms. Daniel Mackay, trainer, is a trainer officer in the Frame of the Well You Project at uh, Teltesoms Hungary. Anastasia Torosienko, she's the Regional Child Protection and MHPSS Advisor at Delta Zone. And Marco um, Cinirella is facilitator in training of the team up uh, intervention methodology at um, SOS Children's Villages Italy. Anka Pavel, she is the uh, Resilience Innovation Facility uh, Coordinator and Trainer at Delta Zones Romania. Maria Crivedios is facilitator and trainer for the team up methodology at SO Children Villages Italy. Sara Sumaruga is the MHPSS uh, communications and team up trainer at SO Children's Villages Italy. And finally, Sara Ferreira, she's facilitator and training trainer of the team up intervention methodology. Finally, myself as the mental health advocacy advisor for the WellU project at SOS International. Um, our agenda for today features a keynote addressing highlighting MHPSS importance, followed by trainers' perspectives on methodologies like TMAP, PM Plus, Reach Now, and MGSC, emphasizing cultural sensitivity taken into account during these trainings and addressing the implementation challenges across Italy, Greece, Hungary, and Romania. Then we will engage in an open discussion to share insights, ask questions, and explore effective strategies focusing on potential policy impacts, impacts and tailoring MHPSS approaches to diverse cultural contexts. Uh, in closing, I will share details about our upcoming webinars and ways that you can connect uh, with the community of practice within the framework of the well -view. And as said previously, I already encourage everyone to actively engage by sharing your questions and comments in the chat and in the Q&A um, section. Um, so the, the WellU project, just to give a short overview, aims at enhancing the mental health and psychosocial well-being of refugee children and their caregivers, with a specific focus on those displaced uh, due to the Ukrainian conflict. So over a 24-month period, the project uh, coordinated by SOS Children's Villages Italy in collaboration with partners such as Terte Soms, World Child, and SOS Children's Villages International seeks to increase the capacity of non MHPSS uh, professionals, improve the well being of affected populations in four countries. I already mentioned Italy, Greece, Hungary, and Romania, and to foster awareness, knowledge sharing, and best practices among health and lay professionals. Um, this initiative is co-funded by the European Union and aims to empower non-MHPSS professionals through evidence-based and highly structured interventions such as Reach Now, uh, Team Up, uh, Movement Games, uh, Sport Creativity, and Problem Management Plus. And of course, our project advocates for a public health approach, fostering awareness, knowledge sharing, and best practices to ensure access to appropriate mental health support for refugee populations. So now uh, we are honored to have uh, Anne Mitaru. She's the International Director of Advocacy at SOS Children's Villages International with us. Ms. Mitaru will share her insights during and emphasizing the crucial role of MHPSS in emergency responses, especially for refugees populations, with a focus on children and young people. Thank you, Anne, and happy that you have joined us. Thank you very much, Pamela, and um, my um, hat tip to those who have come together, not just for the WellU project, but also for this webinar. Double hat tip to those of you who are joining us from around the world to learn about this project, but also about transforming mental health and psychosocial support in emergency responses. My role for the next 10 minutes, I just looked at my clock, 
is to primarily set the stage and just take us to a space whereby mentally we are very clear of what trauma is experienced by children and young people in emergency settings and emergency responses. How emergency responses are important to addressing that trauma. My goal is to set the stage so that when in pursuant presentations, we will be able to listen, to learn, and evidence will be shared with us that we can interrogate for the benefit of those who have lived through emergency situations and need help. Off the fly, it's important to say that children's right to help, including mental health, is enshrined in the conventions of the rights of the child under Article 27, which says, you know what? Every child has a right to a standard of living that can guarantee their physical, mental, spiritual, moral, and social development. Mental development is pertinent, is central to the thriving life of any child and young person. In contrast to that, it's important to indicate that data from UNICEF has shown that one in every 10 children is affected by conflict. Now, this is data from about four or five years ago. One in every 10 ch children is affected by conflict. And this does not include the full loop of emergencies that children find themselves in. If you're wondering what emergencies those are, they would be natural disasters, as we've seen around the floods, floods around the world, or drought, which causes famine, or um, earthquakes. So those are natural disasters and hazards. And then the conflicts, whether it's a spike in a conflict, so acute conflict, or whether it's long ongoing conflict, chronic conflict. So essentially, the number of children who are affected in humanitarian emergencies and whose mental health is suffering is much higher than one in every 10. What are the common diagnoses of where there has been, you know, a response? It is primarily, you know, post-traumatic stress disorders, we have different kinds of anxieties. We have major depression. Those have been the most common diagnosis, di diagnosis that have taken place. I think it's important to reiterate that the experience of any child um, in an emergency could be for a various number of reasons, whether they have been maimed during the emergency, a pet, or a loved one, a family member has been maimed or been killed, whether they have faced denial of humanitarian aid, that is also a problem. The loss of their homes is a problem. One thing that the European Union communicated in July, 2023, was a statement that was issued by the Commission of the European Parliament the Council and the European Economic and Social Committee. They provided a communique where they called on their member states to prioritize mental health with urgency. And they called for three main things. The first one was to integrate mental health across policies. Pamela spoke earlier and said, this is a public health issue. Depending on where you come from, in some countries, it's seen as a criminal issue. For example, a person living with depression who decides to take away their life can in some jurisdictions be found guilty of trying to kill themselves. And as such, they are found, you know, guilty and, you know, could be punished for trying that. I think we've gotten to the point in this discourse of mental health that we're trying to remove the stigma and asking lots of people who are struggling with mental health in as far as it is possible to speak out. But we're also asking governments to change the trends and their reception towards mental health illnesses so that they're not seen as a criminal justice issue, but rather as a public health issue. And in the call by the European Union, they've asked their member states to integrate mental health across policies, across different spectrums of policies, because it touches on every single um, chapter of of the living, the lived life and lived realities of citizens. The second one is to promote good mental health 
and prevention and early intervention platforms Ooh. is really important as well. Last but not least, and biasedly, my favorite, boost mental health for children and young people. Children and young people are facing hurdles that are very, very hard. It requires them to dig deep, but sometimes it's not just about character. There have been offhanded remarks, oh, that's about character they didn't go through, what we're going through. When it comes to mental health, it's not about what your body can and cannot do. It is like a disease, like any other, that requires attention and that requires support and that requires a person to receive coping skills to improve their functionality. And that's what MHPSS is. It's mental health and psychosocial support, which focuses on providing coping skills to those who are struggling with PTSD, anxiety, or depression, as we've noted earlier, and improving their functionality in everyday living. It's important that that kind of intervention is provided by health skilled workers, but also there are very clear interventions that have demonstrated that the provision of these services through trained counselors using different tested and tried methodologies is going to be very important in the coming year and years ahead. Why? Because access to mental health services is not sufficient. And also, depending on the gravity of mental health and the diagnosis that one has received, it is possible to provide a child or a young person with coping skills without them having to see a psychologist, a psychiatrist. I'm sure that information will come more as we go along. So the most often implemented, you know, activities for coping for MHPSS are, could be counseling, could be child-friendly spaces, supporting community initiat initiatives, social initiatives, you know, increasing awareness, um, about social psychosocial education. It could be recreational or you know, creative activities such as painting or crafting or ETC. But more importantly, it could also be training aid workers and people who are responsible for working with children on diverse uh, techniques of providing this support. As we go through this conversation, again, I'm just looking at my clock. I have a minute left. I hope that you will be drawn to the different methodologies that will be presented here in trying to provide access to services, but access to health for those who are very severely impacted. I think it's important to say that a humanitarian emergency just doesn't end when that emergency ends. Displacement is an emergency, particularly for people who were displaced due to either the war or the, you know, the natural disasters. And as such, in this piece of work that we will be exploring and that we are working with well you, we look at the needs of displaced populations for one of the ongoing wars, the war um, in Ukraine. Ladies and gentlemen, feel very welcome. Tune in and stay with us to the very end as we learn more about the project of well you and the interventions to ensure that children and young people are providing with provided with the coping skills that they need. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne, for these amazing words and this amazing introduction. Now I would like to, is the perfect way to transition into our next speakers. George and Eleftheria will be presenting on the PM Plus methodology from Terte Um, Thank you, Pamela. Uh, and thank you everyone who is joining this webinar. My name is Eleftheria Ravido. I'm the MSPSS coordinator for Terre de Zome uh, ELAS. So before focusing on some uh, challenges and um, good practices and recommendation with regards to the provision of uh, the PM Plus trainings and also about the implementation process, I will um, give you a very short um, uh, overview of the PM Plus methodology. And I guess that for some of you, I will just to refresh some uh, uh, knowledge that they already have around the PM Plus methodology. So if we could move to the next slide, thank you. So uh, Problem Management Plus is a WHO uh, tool who has de been developed back in uh, 2016 as a brief psychological intervention of uh, low intensity. It is delivered by non-professionals, uh, which mean lay helpers, but uh, who have been trained on the methodology. 
and um, using as main um, foundation the principles of task shifting and peer support uh, with the aim to provide help to people 16 plus uh, who may experience some type of, um, of distress. Uh, during the PM Plus um, intervention, um, we deliver um, seven sessions, five, five sessions and uh, plus uh, two assessment of 90 minutes, uh, where the PM Plus uh, clients or the PM Plus beneficiaries um, have the opportunity to, to learn how they can manage their practical uh, problems, how they can um, reduce their level of uh, stress and anxiety, how they can improve either mood through behavioral activation and being uh, motivated enough to do so, and also how to develop and also strengthen um, the social support um, network around them. So they actually uh, learn some specific strategies. Um, PM Plus, even though it uh, does not provide uh, help and support for people who may face severe mental health uh, issues, it can stand in the clinical care system and in the MHPSS referral uh, pathway uh, because during the session, the PM Plus helpers have the opportunity to actually identify people who may uh, be in need of a more um, focused and uh, specific intervention uh, of uh, mental health professionals so they could be able to detect and refer such cases to the relevant mental health um, services. So um, I will give uh, the floor to my colleague, um, George, in order to provide you some um, information about the delivery of um, the trainings before we dive in into the challenges and the good practices of the uh, delivering trainings and the implementation process. George? Uh, thank you, Eleftheria. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm going to give you a few information, uh, not uh, that much, uh, with regards uh, to the trainings uh, on the PM Plus methodology that we have organized uh, under the WellU project. Uh, as Eleftheria mentioned, uh, as we have the specialization in uh, TDH Greece, TDH LAS, uh, on that methodology, we organized uh, three different trainings on the same methodology. Uh, the first one took place in uh, Hungary, in Budapest, uh, with, um, in collaboration with our colleagues from TDH uh, Hungary. Uh, the training had a duration of eight days uh, and uh, there were 14 participants uh, that attended the physical with their physical presence the training. Uh, after the completion of uh, that, uh, we had a, an online module of eight hours for uh, supervisors training, meaning that uh, not only during the uh, eight days uh, uh, of the physical presence, uh, we trained uh, the participants how to be a PM Plus um, uh, helpers, and uh, uh, the second part that was uh, the online training was uh, how to be uh, PM Plus supervisors. Uh, that's why also, yes, in total, as you can see, this is um, uh, the hours. Uh, this is a quite long and uh, I would say um, not easy, quite um, energy consuming and time consuming training, but uh, also the methodology requires uh, such an investment of time and of energy. Uh, so that was the first one. The second one was in uh, Bucharest, in uh, Romania, in collaboration again with our colleagues uh, of uh, TDH Romania, uh, with uh, 18 participants this time, and uh, the module was uh, the same as I already described. And uh, the third one uh, took place in Greece, in Athens, uh, with uh, 13 participants, and also the first part uh, for the PM Plus helpers uh, uh, with uh, their physical presence and the second part uh, online uh, of uh, eight hours. Uh, what I would like to highlight for those uh, three trainings is that we, as a um, well, you project that targets mainly members of the Ukrainian community and people that uh, have been affected due to the war and due to the displacement. Uh, we gave the opportunity and actually we prioritized uh, people uh, for um, Ukrainian people, people from the Ukrainian communities in all the th three countries for that trainings. Uh, without excluding, of course, uh, people with different uh, nationalities and different origins and different uh, professional backgrounds. Uh, somehow we tried to 
combine members of the communities, but also professionals and people with um, in different positions uh, with experience in providing psychosocial support uh, to the affected population. Uh, that made the trainings uh, with these um, multicultural and multidisciplinary uh, teams made the trainings uh, quite uh, interesting uh, and uh, quite interactive. And at least that's um, what we have seen, what we have experienced throughout uh, this, uh, yes, this very, very nice experience. So in a nutshell, this is all about uh, the trainings uh, on the PM Plus methodology. And uh, now I give back the floor to Eleftheria to give us more insights about this, uh, this methodology. Eleftheria, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, George. So let's talk about some uh, of the main uh, challenges and also some good practices that we highlighted during our work with, um, with Problem Management Plus methodology. First of all, let me say that PM Plus is quite popular methodology among uh, professionals, is, um, is an approach that is gaining ground in the MHPSS context in various settings. So being part of uh, such a training, especially for professionals who are searching and looking for such uh, opportunity um, was great. So actually we didn't have much difficulties to, uh, to recruit or to retain trainees. Uh, the only difficulty was related, um, as George mentioned before, to the, um, uh, to the length of the training, because uh, usually it's uh, eight to ten days, consecutive days of training, very intensive, uh, demands a lot of um, engagement and also some uh, um, personal work, let's say, outside the training uh, hours. So we would say that this was the main difficulty to, to recruit and retain trainees, even though we didn't um, have um, many or, I guess, zero drop-offs. Um, especially for for participants that uh, were uh, it was not feasible to be present for all these uh, eight to ten consecutive uh, days, we suggested some um, some follow up um, meetings. So uh, it could be really helpful for them not to interrupt their learning process and also not to lose this um, connection and engagement with the rest of the team. But uh, what we would like to pinpoint is that um, we need to reassure that during the recruitment of the trainees for this uh, methodology is for them to have strong motive to reassure that they have strong strong motive, their interest is um, deep, that they really want to participate in such a training and that they already hold some basic helping skills or at least the willingness to, um, to build up on their existing skills and further develop their potential. Because it is a methodology that during the trainings, uh, you all should um, have the chance to do a lot of um, work, I mean, with yourself as well. Because all we talk about is about mental, mental health. So some, some good practices and some recommendation based also in our um, last field experience um, we have with TDH LAS. First of all, all the trainings were developed uh, and conducted based on our field experience and of course following the guidance manual uh, for the PM Plus helpers training of uh, WHO. But um, because of our implementation experience, this helped us to have a more, let's say, critical approach towards uh, the, um, the methodology as uh, we kind of knew which points, which tools or uh, scripts and um, suggestions of the manual of WHO could actually work and with which we, we had to be more, um, let's say, critical and skeptical about. And the same way we approached all the challenges and the clarifications that were raised on specific topics during uh, the trainings, based on our field experience that we have in, um, um, in refugee camps here in Greece. Also, it was very important and is very important for such a methodology to keep a balance between theory and practice. Uh, this was the reason that we included a lot of um, activities and role playings because actually trainings uh, may be the only um, opportunity for a trainee to actually meet, let's say, a real client before going to, to the field. Of course, we had some small and regular adaptations. <clears throat> due to the contextual and cultural differences and for being in alignment with our participant needs. 
even though I can say that it 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 was not um I mean that um that much. Um, as it is a, a, a long and a, um, very intense training, uh, we would recommend the provision of some incentives to the trainers, uh, depending on the on the resources we we have, in order to actually engage them for such a long um, period, and something that it could be useful. I, I guess for all methodologies, but especially for PM Plus, is that it's better to to secure. Uh, the the context of the field practice to know exactly where we will go to to apply this methodology before uh, developing and conducting trainings in order to be able to to actually design them in a more focused and specific um, way. Um, next slide, please. And. Um, uh, an overview of the challenges and recommendation on the implementation uh, process, especially based, um, I mean, some of the points that you can see in the slide and I'm going to talk about um, are also uh, conclusions, things that we included from our last field experience. Um, so far, especially in Greece, the implementation has been a great uh, challenge due to lack of direct access to potential uh, beneficiaries. Um, especially due to um, asylum processes, um, relocations, uh, housing issues that potential PM Plus uh, clients um, have, or the priority of, um, of people to provide the essentials for their families and for living that set and could set uh, the involvement of um, an MSPSS intervention lower in their priority list. And this is why we we highlighted a lot the, the the external incentives for people to participate in such intervention. Uh, so external incentives could, should be considered for ensuring participation for both parties for the uh, potential uh, PM Plus helpers and the potential PM Plus clients, because PM Plus demands a lot of effort, a lot of engagement and practice. So in order to ensure their participation in a full cycle of PM Plus, we should consider external incentives, financial or other type of incentive, depending on, um, on our resources. And some three really important um, points that uh, um, we saw uh, and we concluded uh, based uh, on our involvement engagement with PM Plus so far is the importance of having a robust supervision um, uh, system. This is uh, the reason um, we actually uh, put a lot of effort and attention also, as George mentioned, to the supervision uh, training because it's a key uh, to the success of PM Plus especially uh, when we have in our team non-specialized mental health uh, psychosocial staff. I will highlight once more the contextualization. So no MHPSS intervention without contextualization. This was our um, motto, let's say. So culturally adapting and contextualizing PM Plus is of a great importance and essential for maximizing the potential benefits, bene benefits of the intervention. And because uh, we, we are dealing with a methodology that is being provided by non-mental uh, health professionals. So actually the mental health professionals could be a bit of um, uh, critical and skeptical about this. So we should uh, ensure that um, we, we put a lot of attention to the rollout of the, of the project, ensure that the goals, the methodology, the process is being clearly communicated to population and to networks of the actors. And of course, make sure that there is actually an MHPSS referral system or a clinical care system in place that PM Plus could be actually be embedded into this and um, maximize the, um, the, the, the potential, uh, the psychosocial support uh, opportunities and potentials for the beneficiaries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adefredi and George, for your valuable presentation. And let's move forward to Anastasia and Daniel, who will, will be discuss the NGSC methodology, and they are coming from Terdeso. 
The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pamela. Thank you very much, everyone, for having joined us today. And um, uh, with uh, Daniel, we would like to begin our presentation um, by providing a brief overview of TDH MHPSS framework. And uh, we can uh, start the presentation. Thank you. So here on the slide, uh, you can see the core elements of the framework. What is really important to emphasize is that all the elements are interconnected and they should be considered simultaneously when we design, when we implement, when we monitor and evaluate MHPSS interventions. So starting from the left si uh, side, there are um, five pillars or building blocks of well-being. Those are the pillars of safety and security, relationships and connections, roles, responsibilities and identities, and hope and meaning. So in situations of vulnerability, unfortunately, those five core pillars become unstable. As such, uh, children, families, and communities exposed to adversities, they are supported by, by practitioners in this stabilization process to have the pillars stabilized to regain their uh, psychosocial well-being and resilience. Uh, the next element is the resilience uh, capacity approach. And for TDH, uh, there are three levels of resilience. Uh, these are capacity to cope, capacity to adapt, and capacity to transform. And uh, with this, we uh, underscore that MHPSS interventions should ultimately look at supporting transformative capacities of individuals, families, and communities. Uh, the next element is a socio-ecological model that acknowledges um, that it's important to consider parents, communities, and the systems in which the child develops when we support their well-being. Um, then comes the MHPSS uh, pyramid that stresses that each level of the pyramid is equally important when we prevent individual and collective distress and uh, when we support mental health and social well-being. Um, as such, the, 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 the service provision is based uh, on, on, on our understanding that uh, psychosocial well-being and mental health exist on a continuum across the four layers of the pyramid. And the final element of the framework, look at the necessary um, cross-cutting considerations, which are community-based MHPSS, gender and diversity, uh, contextual approaches, and their rights-based participation. So uh, taken together, the MHPSS framework articulates our common goal of promote, promoting psychosocial well-being and resilience at any stage of uh, evolving context, of evolving needs. Uh, this is particularly relevant uh, to the context of protracted crisis where the lines between humanitarian development and peace building activities are increasingly blurred. As such, we want to ensure uh, complementarity and continuity between them. All right, uh, with this in place, please let's move to, to, to the next slide. And one more element to, and two more. Yes, thank you. Uh, one of the methodologies that TDH developed and implements for supporting children is called movement, games, sports, and creativity. So what we call MGSC. Uh, this methodology takes its origins from 2005, and since then was implemented in several emergency and development contexts. Uh, the methodology uses um, sport games and uh, creativity as a psychosocial tool to develop personal and social skills of vulnerable children, and therefore to improve their psychosocial well-being and resilience. Uh, this method methodology is primarily aimed at supporting children uh, who are aged from 4 to 14, though uh, uh, youth can also uh, benefit uh, from, uh, from those activities. Uh, the methodology is really flexible. It doesn't function as a curriculum, but rather through the selection of sessions. The range of skills that uh, this methodology supports is quite wide as um, it aims to 
engage the child at different levels, at the level of their cognitive capacities, physical capacities, and psychosocial capacities. Uh, the, uh, the, the outcome of this methodology is very much based on the capacity of adult facilitators who conduct the sessions and in the way they are able to support participation, to support collaboration and uh, inclusion during activities. And uh, this is ensured through the experiential learning, uh, experiential learning methodology, also called learning by experience. So you can see uh, circular yellow arrows at the, at the bottom of the page. And the, the, the learning by experience means that participating children go through three steps of learning. Firstly, they, they are invited to experience a new game. Then they pause for discussion, for reflection, for feedback. And from there, they proceed to the second, this time more um, active experience of the game. Uh, this cycle is repeated as often as wished with uh, several pauses for feedback until facilitator can see that the uh, objectives of the game are reached. Uh, considering a strong focus of MGSC on the skills of facilitators, uh, the methodology has a very strong training package that, uh, that is aimed at strengthening facilitators' personal skills, social skills, methodological skills, and technical ones. And in the right upper corner, you can see some of the key MGSC resources that uh, we would like to invite you to explore, and hopefully uh, you will be able to benefit from them in the course of, of your work. Uh, and uh, with this overview provided, I would like to hand over the floor to my colleague, Daniel, who will walk us through some of the key highlights of MGSC implementation in uh, Hungary. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Daniel Makai, and as a training officer uh, in the value project uh, in Hungary, I would like to uh, uh, talk about uh, the main challenges we have been facing during the implementation of MGSC activities, uh, targeting Ukrainian children who have been living in Budapest for almost uh, two years now. So the first thing uh, is uh, that schooling is compulsory uh, for uh, children in Hungary. So they spend most of their time in schools. Uh, and it's clear that the methodology uh, would be best applied in school frames, but uh, as I will explain later, uh, working with schools has its own uh, institutional barriers. So we reach uh, our beneficiaries uh, uh, with MHPHS activities mainly in our community center, uh, the so-called uh, Re Resilience Innovation Facility. Uh, we established two of these facilities in uh, Hungary, and we have also in uh, Romania and in Greece also, as far as I know. And we realized that the after school, uh, as after school program, these two hours, approximately two hours of uh, time slots in the afternoon seems a bit narrow to engage the number of children uh, we expect. Uh, another challenge uh, is that um, Ukrainian uh, families uh, live uh, um, all over the city, mainly in rented accommodation. So there is no locally identifiable single Ukrainian community for whom our services could be organized in a complex way, like, uh, like in refugee shelters. Uh, so we are still taking measures to better identify and reach uh, out those who could be engaged in our activities, especially the most uh, vulnerable children. So regarding the acknowledgement of MHPSS uh, in general, although we promote uh, that uh, child's mental well-being and the rewarding social relationships are essential and necessary for effective learning, uh, still most uh, of the parents who are, uh, we contact in are concerned more about their children's progress at school. So they prefer more the support uh, of educational activities, such as uh, school catch-up classes or language classes, although their children often complain about uh, their workload. And this is also true in the institutional level of schools, we're arguing that delivering uh, their own 
curriculum is already a burden on teachers and uh, students, and the playful activities uh, with MHPSS focus uh, can hardly be squeezed in uh, school hours. Uh, they have limited autonomy in the institutional implementation of such methodologies uh, because uh, of the highly bureaucratic procedures uh, which we have to uh, face uh, during the long process of building trust and personal confidence with school actors. So uh, we also facing some bureaucratic uh, uh, barriers. Another main issue that has been expressed since the outbreak of the war uh, by Hungary, mainly by Hungarian NGOs, is the lack of coordination in the level of uh, state authorities. And so the independent organization can mobilize few resources to coordinate their uh, services to be effectively targeted towards uh, our beneficiaries. So our main strategic point is uh, to maintain our uh, community center which also poses some financial challenges and ongoing uh, capacity building. We also uh, uh, work or we've worked uh, with uh, Hungarian speaking Roma families uh, living in refugee shelters during our uh, emergency res response program in uh, Hungary. And in this context, uh, ongoing operations were led by the host organization in a partnership with several uh, other partners like us, and we experienced that there were uh, little time for preparing a well-established and current program based uh, on systematic needs assessment. So we, as a result, uh, um, many initiatives, and I think like MGSC, could be implemented in a kind of pilot version during a limited period, uh, uh, like uh, during summer camps but it was also a great result. Uh, and to continue the cultural perspective, I have to mention uh, how we worked with Roma families. It was quite challenging to systematically adapt uh, previously used support strategies to meet the complex needs of this community that has experienced exclusion and st stigmatization in their country of origin. So we made a great effort towards the cultural understanding to systematically identify and overcome the barriers of uh, prejudices and, uh, and to be able to build trust and confidence and it took a, a long time. And for example, related to MGSC activities, uh, we had to be patient and flexible because we couldn't expect uh, the regular presence of the children uh, during our weekly sessions. Therefore, uh, we need to make further uh, efforts to fulfill uh, one of our main uh, goal uh, to start joint activities uh, with Ukrainian and Hungarian speaking Roma and non-Roma Ukrainian children with, uh, together with local uh, Hungarian children. And lastly, to mention the language barriers, we are involving Ukrainian and Hungarian speaking professionals and also we train the uh, lay professionals from uh, the Ukrainian uh, community, and we involve them in our program. And also, this issue is becoming less of an of obstacle as many of the children have already learned Hungarian in the past two years, which is wonderful. And i always surprised how uh, they progress in learning Hungarian. So uh, that's it in a nutshell. And the, our last slide, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, our mitigation measures, most of them have been uh, already mentioned before. And just to summarize, we created a safe play, uh, space for children in our uh, resilience innovation facility in an accessible location, which is very important to find uh, uh, the right place in the, in the city to be able to reach uh, 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 a lot of uh, people from the refugee community. We organized summer camps and it turned out to be a good solution to, to involve a lot of children. We were facilitating regular activities in refugee shelters. So we brought our uh, uh, services uh, where uh, refugee children lived. And uh, we continue our partnership building with schools, local stakeholders, service providers, and uh, we support regular coordination meetings with uh, partner organizations, which is essential. 
to continue our work. So that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Anastasia and Daniel, for these important insights. And now we move into our third um, methodology. So I invite Marco, Sinirella, Sara Ferreira, Maria Cribello, and Sara Sumaruca. Thank you. Um, Okay, so hello everybody. We are starting with a very short video, uh, which is about uh, uh, team up. So that will uh, show a bit the methodology and uh, from from the words of our trainers. Siamo a Crotone dove si è appena concluso il training per facilitatori team up della durata di quattro giorni. Il training è inserito all'interno del contesto del progetto europeo WellU, che è un progetto i cui destinatari ultimi sono bambini e ragazzi di cittadinanza ucraina. Quindi le facilitatrici che hanno preso parte a questo training nelle prossime settimane, nei prossimi mesi, faciliteranno sessioni di team up regolarmente con gruppi composti anche da bambini di cittadinanza ucraina. Il percorso inizia qui perché al training segue un periodo di mentoring per le nuove facilitatrici. Sotto il tutoraggio di noi trainer appunto implementeranno team up Sono previsti altri training in altre città italiane e quindi anche qua questo è solo l'inizio. So thanks for watching that. I think it set a little bit the mood, but now I'm passing the ball to my colleagues, uh, Tara and Maria, who will provide the brief introduction of the structure of the training itself. Thank you, Sara. Hi, everyone. I'm Maria, and I'm a facilitator and trainer team up for uh, SOS. Um, so as regards the training, it is conducted by two or three trainers and for people who usually work with the children. Um, before the training, people um, do a course, in particular a child protection and child safeguarding course. And for us, uh, it's very important to talk about three principles that uh, um, the training follow, that are we do, we model and we care. We do because uh, we act, <laughs> we model because for us it's very important the demonstration and uh, we care because uh, we take care uh, of our participant before, during and after the training uh, as then the facilitator do with the, their children. The training is uh, composed by um, two days of startup, two days of follow up and 20 uh, super uh, supervised uh, session. So <laughs> now, thank you, and uh, pass my ball to Sara. Thank you, Maria. Hello, everyone. Um, well, as, as Maria said, we, we can do uh, today's uh, startup and today's follow-up combined, or maybe we can do just today's uh, in one period and then uh, the um, trainees start to facilitate in sessions with the kids and then we can do the follow-up. There is these two versions. And then uh, the evaluation of the training happens in, in, in many, um, in different 
in different moments. Um, we have the content evaluation during the training. So we start the training with the fridge, for example, in which people can uh, put their questions little by little and then and their worries and expectations and what was clear or not. And then we little by little doing the training, we see if we answer all the questions. And then at the end, if we see that there is any questions open, we, we try to uh, get it uh, again. And, and at the, in the end of the training, we put everything that we talk about because it team up, we use a lot of visuals. We do not use slides and anything is visual. So uh, even this, they move into the space in order to, to stick where they, they think they are more confident, what they understood better, what they need to understand more and then we take it to account for the mentoring sessions uh, also there is the trainer's evaluation during and after the training and one thing that we uh, one method um, one method that we use is to talk about uh, um what what, what uh, things that works well things that were difficult and things that we we could do differently and this is one uh, uh one uh one way of doing evaluation also we do a sandwich we call it the sandwich that it's to 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 give uh between them because during the team up training we do a, a lot of uh, we do a lot of simulations of the sessions with the kids so they have a moment to talk about how was it and we use the sandwich that is the top, tip, and top. We always finish with the top because it's good to leave people with uh, a thing that went well. And the tip is more like an advice instead of only critic and that's it. So it's like, okay, uh, if I think you can do better in this, how I think you can do it. So it's a... Uh, a really participated training because we also believe that we have a lot to, as trainers, we have a lot to learn as well from our participants. And we also have a team up is a methodology that is really structured and gives all the, the, the things that uh, the facilitators need uh, in order to do a great work that they have the preparation form for their sessions and the evaluation form. So I'll think, uh, I'll prepare my session with the games, taking into account how many kids do I have, the, if they're male or female and their age and with theme I would like to work. Um, and the division of, of, uh, of tasks that each facilitator will have and then evaluation, how was the session? And this is one block. We also have the adherence checklist that is between the group of facilitators. How was our, our, um, our work together? How, is, uh, how do I think it was my individual work in the preparation during the session and after the session? And the logbook that it's uh, a tracker for your team up journey. That it's uh, that it can track uh, when you studied, uh, when was the startup, the follow up, the mentoring, the, the sessions, so you can get your badge as a certificate uh, a team up facilitator. Thank you very much. I pass the ball to my colleagues Sarah and Marco. Thank you, Sarah, taking the ball. Uh, so uh, let's. Let's go deeper into our uh, team up journey in Wellu. So in total, we had the chance to meet and work with uh, um, three, uh, yeah, a lot of people from different contexts. So with parents, volunteer, educators, pedagogues, and psychologists who work with uh, uh, Ukrainian refugees, uh, uh, children, and of course, parents uh, too. Um, we had uh, um, a large pool in this sense. So we uh, would like to specify that uh, um, for team up, uh, you don't have to be um, a professional in, MH, in the MHPSS field, 
but uh, that uh, um, uh, it is sufficient to participate in the training and uh, uh, follow the um, implementation path. So conducting, facilitating the uh, supervision with children to do so. Uh, we work, um, we um, actually um, apply uh, the methodology with uh, three groups in uh, Crotone, uh, before the summer and then uh, um, so in the south of Italy in uh, Mantua in the north of Italy uh, at the end of the year and uh, uh, this training was followed by uh, last training in Torino uh, still in the north uh, of Italy at the end of the year. Uh, during the trainings as uh, mentioned uh, by uh, my colleagues we had the chance to uh, work with the different participants and uh, um, through a very active and uh, proactive methodology that uh, uh, implies um, a lot the contributions from participants uh, themselves that knows their context best. We had the, the opportunity to apply the team up uh, uh, intervention to each of the specific contexts. Um, Regarding, uh, of course, uh, uh, we had the, the possibility um, to um, listen to uh, also um, organize some implementation plan in order to um, develop further the methodology in the course of the, the next week. And we are still in contact with our wonderful uh, trainees. But uh, um, we had the, um, of course, we met during uh, um, the trainings um, themselves, uh, some challenges. And uh, for this, uh, I'm passing the ball uh, uh, to my colleague, Marco. Thank you, Sara. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. It's very nice to be here to learn from uh, other colleagues and other methodologies, and of course, also for sharing our successes and uh, and challenges and this is the last topic that uh, we are sharing uh, with you regarding team up um, as we said uh, team up is a very practical approach and consider that the most of uh, the learning pathway is done by um, doing learning on the job um, as we said, we mentor uh, trained facilitators during a period of time. They have this chance to implement uh, TMAP under our uh, supervision. Let's say we will we we organize periodically uh, periodical uh, mentoring uh, meeting online or uh, in the field if this is possible. And well, uh, TMAP can. Uh, uh, work with uh, with people, well, let's say all over the world, because we use a lot of the body and um, all the game that uh, the children are invited to play uh, are uh, just uh, useful for for using the body and so try to overcome the language barriers. But let's say that's one of the challenges that we face uh, during the um, implementation of the team up training for facilitator was language barriers in the sense that uh, we uh, we really need and we uh, we have this clear in our mind now as a specific point. Uh, it's really needed the enrollment of a translator because of course we will model for our participants, but uh, we have a time in which we unpack and we, we, and we analyze the map intervention. And this is uh, very needed to have a translator uh, in order to also uh, uh, collect the feedback from the participants and give them the possibility to uh, share their uh, questions in their languages um, because also we care as we said at the beginning so this is uh, one topic really relevant for us and one thing one thing that we we noted in in all our reports so is really needed the presence of one of 
of at least one uh, one translator uh, when we are providing that map uh, training in other uh, countries. Then we face it uh, a bit of challenges during the phase of enrollment of uh, of potential facilitators, in the sense that, uh, as we said. Um, CMAP requires that um, CMAP facilitators have this kind of uh, mode of working with children, um, also maybe the expertise in, in uh, playing activities with children, in do activities with children, uh, movement-based activities, and a bit of background on MH. PSS, mental health and psychosocial support. But of course, it's not a specific intervention. You have not to be a psychologist or educator or pedagogue to be uh, in order to become a TMAP uh, facilitator. Uh, uh, but this project will you was very specific because uh, um, the potential facilitators, um, they had to guarantee that they uh, can work directly with uh, Ukrainian children. So um, they were invited to taking part in the team up training, uh, but they were also asked to uh, implement team up directly with, uh, with, Ukrainian, uh, with Ukrainian children. And this was a bit, uh, this was really a, a bit challenging us in a way because uh, this was really specific. And in the phase that we are facing now in Italy, uh, it was uh, difficult in a way to find this uh, specific profile. And last one, um, this is one of the challenges that we have uh, not only uh, in the value well, implementation, but more or less uh, every time that we implement, uh, we implement Stima. Um, participants have the fear, in a way, that implement Stima, doing Stima session with children can be a kind of uh, uh, overload, uh, um, work that they have to do in excess, um, because it's difficult for them to see that Stima, in a way, can help them in their daily work with children if they are uh, already working with children because at the beginning team up is seen with something um, in addition to the activities that uh, they normally do uh, in their in their job um, so this was a bit challenging uh, to see and to find the way to adapt the team up intervention in order to be uh, to support them in their daily work and not to give them, uh, let's say, uh, an uh, overload of of, uh, of work in excess. Um, that's all I think also from uh, from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Team Up Team, for the amazing presentation. And this leads us to our last presentation of today. Uh, I invite Anka. Hello, and thank you thank for you. having me. I will be presenting the Reach Now methodology um, as we were trained on it um, over the course of 2023 uh, in Terdozon, Romania. Uh, you can proceed to the first slide. OK. Uh, which now, uh, first, first and foremost, it is a detection tool. So it is not an investigation or an intervention tool as opposed to the ones presented previously uh, by my colleagues. It is a detection tool and a self-help seeking encouragement tool uh, for children and adolescents who are in need of uh, mental health support. So uh, Rich now uh, basically provides you with a template of uh, emotional and behavioral signals that you can look for in children affected by war, specifically by the war in Ukraine, uh, to figure out if uh, they are in need of further mental health support. And the way you do this is by observing them uh, on a prolonged period of time to see if these um, behavioral distress signs are something that are temporary or if they are indeed affecting 
uh, the child's functionality and day-to-day -day life, in which case they are referred as the last part of implementing the tool. Um, and I was also mentioning the war in Ukraine because uh, Reach Now is a tool based on context. So the version that we were trained on, uh, InterDesign was the one, uh, the version they developed for the refugees of Ukraine because InterDesign has been working uh, with the refugees of Ukraine for almost two years now. Uh, we trained staff who provide MHPSS activities regularly. These are staff that use every day the MGSC methodology that uh, Daniel and Anastasia presented earlier. Um, but we did not train the psychologists as they do uh, take a part in the later pathway to care that a child would go through once they would be detected by other uh, professionals that we have. Uh, which means that to be able to implement which now as a methodology in an organization, you would have to have a referral pathway or develop a, a referral pathway, uh, just like we did. So in terms of sessions, we uh, had one training of trainers that I also took part of. And then me and the, the colleagues that were trained in this session, we uh, provided two trainings for our colleagues in Bucharest. And then we have another team in Brasov and we provided a separate training for them as well. Um, and for uh, reasons that I will soon explain and for challenges that we face, we are planning to have one more refresher session in January of 2024. Now, in terms of how the training and tool was perceived, we had an overwhelming 100% satisfaction rate reported by trained staff. Uh, this happened mostly because uh, all the people attending the training found a complementarity with existing services uh, and existing methodologies that we implement uh, in Tertism Romania. Most of the staff uh, is trained in all three methodologies uh, that were presented. So in MGSC, in PM Plus, and in Reach Now, and at least two uh, of them, um, two of these methodologies, they are trained to all of them. So some of them are uh, knowledgeable in at least two of these methodologies, which uh, allows us to provide a great range of care to our beneficiaries. If you can proceed to the next slide. Okay. Um, so we, as I mentioned, we had uh, the first training in Bucharest was at the end of August. Uh, the second training was at the end of September and then in Brasov because our team is smaller and uh, we had some difficulties in planning uh, and not overlapping with their activities. We had the training at the beginning of November. Uh, in terms of uh, staff, we originally had 19 staff trained in total. Um, this including the supervisors and we are now remaining with 11 staff in total, including the supervisors. So it is a bit less of them who uh, will be implementing original methodology. Um, and this bleeds a bit into my next point, which is the challenges that we faced with Reach Now. Uh, we were unfortunately um, forced to downsize at the end of 2023, which meant that the implementation was a bit delayed by the fact that we had to uh, wait out and see who of the remaining staff would be able to implement Reach Now and what other methodologies they were knowledgeable in to be able to have a coherence between them. And also, uh, up to faith and circumstance, the biggest other challenge was that in Romania in summer, uh, the conditions to access financial support by refugees became very strict, which meant that over the summer we saw a huge uh, movement trend uh, in the midst of refugees um, with a lot of our beneficiaries that we had been working with day to day uh, moving to back to Ukraine or choosing to transition to other European countries. And this affected us because, as I said, it is important to reach now to have continuity with those beneficiaries to be able to determine if they fit the template of reach now and if the signals that they are showcasing are actually disrupting their life. And up to the next slide, because the uh, challenges that I were, was mentioning were 
quite out of our control and they had a vast impact. Uh, we are just now uh, transitioning to implementing fully um, not only this methodology, but we are looking uh, here in Romania to provide some sort of coherence and cohesion um, for all the methodologies, because again, uh, our staff, uh, me included, uh, has been trained in three of these methodologies and they do have a coherence because for example, reach now is actually some kind of the first step that you would take where you would identify uh, the refugee first and then you may choose to refer them to MGSC um, activities as part of MHPSS activities, of course, you may choose to refer them to PM plus this would be, of course, only the case of children 16 to 18 that would fit into that category. Or again, um, they might need uh, professional support, so you would refer them to, to a psychologist. But we are looking to create this coherence because there's a lot of compatibility with the things that we already do and the set of skills that our staff already has. And this is probably, and it would be probably the case for most organizations that would choose to implement this methodology. So as I was saying, we will have this uh, refresher with the remaining stuff where we are focusing on reporting tools, uh, but most importantly, uh, the only dissatisfaction the, uh, the that we had in our survey was that people reported that they found that uh, the reach now needs more time than the two days allotted for the training. Uh, so we are looking into offering the opportunity for people to practice uh, some more study cases and some more role plays, which is kind of the backbone of uh, learning reach now. And also this is addressing one of our uh, issues, which is a cultural barrier. We are fortunate not to have a language barrier as a challenge because our staff um, generally speaks common language with the refugees. Uh, but we do have this issue that I'm assuming that also, you know, NPM plus and other methodologies similar you would have, which is resistance to uh, mental health support as a professional service. So a lot of uh, people who would be identified and reach now um, would also pose resistance when encouraged to seek professional help. So our staff uh, felt like there, it would be worth it to have more time to practice the way in which to present this to be able to break um, the stigma that is around mental health that we did notice um, in the Ukrainian community. And then we are looking into piloting implementation and supervision sessions because again, uh, as for PM Plus in Reach Now, supervision is very important. Um, and our goal is to standardize implementation by uh, maximizing synergies. So again, finding a coherence between Reach Now, which is an uh, identification tool, and other methodologies which are more intervention based. And for this, we have created our referral pathway. We have a map of uh, internal services, MHPSS services. Um, we offer uh, generally group MHPSS activities by animators, but we found that refugees are more comfortable with those in the scheme of the stigma on mental health um, and on the fact that we have been working with most of them for two years now, so they have more trust in us than they would have for now in a um, professional psychologist, which is why we also have uh, higher folks for PM Plus because they're also uh, Based. And then we also have available individual MHPSS sessions offered by a uh, psychologist up to eight sessions uh, per um, person identified who reach now. So all in all, this is it about uh, reach now. Um, in the scheme of implementing these methodologies, you can kind of picture it and visualize it at the beginning of what my colleagues have presented before, because again, it is very important to understand that reach now it is just a detection tool. It is not an, uh, an intervention tool. It is not a diagnosis. Um, and also it does not offer counseling per se. It is just a way to help uh, people who work with children and who work in child protection identify those signs that 
tip you off that something might need intervention and uh, take the proper action to ensure that the child is receiving the correct uh, mental health support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anka, for the interesting presentation. So I invite all the panelists to turn on your cameras. We have a couple minutes to address questions from the public. Otherwise, I have received one, um, one question in, in, by the chat. OK, then I will start. Um, the question I received says, how can we address the challenge of MHPSS uh, methodologies implementation as being perceived as a lower priority by bene beneficiaries, so especially children and young people due to asylum processes? So for instance, housing concerns and other essential living priorities. How might this align with administrative challenges faced by healthcare workers? I know, for instance, uh, Elefteria has uh, mentioned it, this topic. Yes, thank you, Pamela. Actually, um, th thank you so much for the question um, as well. Actually, this is a challenge in general in the MHPSS context because MHPSS uh, services and uh, intervention, especially those who are not directly um, related with focused and specialized uh, services, but mostly on the, um, let's say, the first three levels, as Anastasia uh, also described in the MHPSS intervention pyramid, are never a priority. This is truth. <laughs> so this is always an obstacle when trying to, to design, develop, and implement MHPSS. I'm not sure if I have um, a clear answer to this, um, because um, we cannot ask for someone to prioritize uh, participating in a PSS intervention rather than taking care of uh, asylum uh, processes or uh, housing and relocation processes, etc. We've mentioned about that. But what I have seen in the field that is working is, um, first of all, to, to try to build relationships with the community. So because most of the beneficiaries that have participated in, uh, at least in our intervention, in the settings that we were providing services, uh, were participating because they were trusting us because they knew our work, because the, um, uh, they were coming um, not because of the methodology, uh, but um, because of um, being among and spending time with the people that, with uh, whom they feel safe, uh, secure, and that they can spend some time in, um, in a very safe space and mingle with other people and uh, discuss and exchange views and opinions. So maybe the motive for someone to join an MHPSS intervention is not about the exact methodology or the service, is because of the people that are behind this intervention and the methodology. So I would say what I have seen that has worked in the field was this um, 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 the sense of community, the sense of um, belonging somewhere and uh, um, creating uh, safe spaces uh, for people. And then you can work with, um, you know, um, on the motive to, to, um, of the beneficiaries to, um, to remain in this intervention and keep coming again and again. But it needs a lot of, um, a lot of time. So I would say it is the methodology, but most important is uh, building trustful relationships with, um, with, with beneficiaries. At least this is um, what I have seen that has worked in the field. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Elefteria, for this really amazing answer. We have received one. Uh, it says, thank you all for the clear presentations. I would be curious to know how you have created synergies between the interventions. Were children refer from one intervention to the other? And if so, how does this work? If these were not integrated, would you still integrate all these interventions in a new project? If yes, why not? I could jump in on this one because I touched briefly at the end of my presentation about this. Uh, we have yet to integrate them uh, officially, but we are working on this. 
And this is because uh, we found that they work very well together. So as I was mentioning, REACH now is a detection tool. So you can implement this first and then based on the signals that you notice by applying the tool of REACH now, you can figure out if uh, the child needs uh, professional support or you can actually refer them to MHPSS activities that use MGSC or team up uh, methodology and these we found work very well, especially again, since we do face a lot of stigma on mental health among the community of Ukrainian refugees. So they are tend to be more inclined to participate to MHPSS as uh, support than to go to a psychologist one-on-one, which is more intimidating. And if uh, the child that you identified is aged 16 to 18, you can of course, safely and confidently refer them to a PM plus helper. Thank you so much, Anka. Um, I believe our time is running up. Then uh, if there are no other questions, um, Heidi, we can move into the second poll. And after that, I will move into uh, describing our upcoming webinars within the framework of the WellU project and showing our community of practice. Thank you, Heidi. I believe we can move forward. Perfect. Then to end our current webinar, so we would like to invite you to visit our, our project website. I have posted on the chat and to keep in tune on our upcoming webinar. So we have one on uh, innovations in MHPSS responding to mental health needs for displaced population coming up in March. Then inclusive mental health, inclusive mental health, elevating young people's perspectives. So we aim at emphasizing the crucial, the crucial role of child participation uh, in mental health discussions. So you can find all this information on our platform. I have posted here, um, on the chat and um, this uh, slides would also be available on the Tile Hub uh, platform. So in this, in this link that I have already shared in which you can easily access our community of practice in which if you have further questions regarding the methodologies that were discussed today, if you have uh, more uh, questions regarding what how our speakers have discussed, uh, in the webinar today, uh, please feel free to post them on the forum and we will make sure to, to answer them. Um, perfect. Then I would like to thank you. I would like to thank everyone for joining our webinar today. Thank you so much to TDH uh, Hungary for their amazing support with the logistics and technical side for the webinar today and to our amazing speakers who were truly amazing and they really tackled the topic in a really detailed and interesting way. 
So I'm looking forward for everyone to join our uh, community of practice, post questions, and keep in touch with our upcoming webinars. Thank you so much again, everyone, for being part of today's event. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.